about alcohol. And we are also going to talk about marijuana. So thank you for being here. I'm excited uh, to present to you on substance use in our teens. And thank you to the uh, city of Miami Beach for asking us to share this uh, with the community. So I'm going to um, pull up and share with you my PowerPoint. Um, so we have the presentation to, to look at. Let me see here, I'm having a little technical difficulty. Hold on one second. Well, my, um, my PowerPoint does not seem to want to share at the moment. I apologize, just give me one second. Okay, well, we're gonna have some difficulty here tonight. So I think um, you're not gonna see my PowerPoint, unfortunately. Um, I'm just gonna share with you then and talk a little bit about vaping, marijuana and um, alcohol in our, in our teens. So um, it's interesting, um, we see the numbers of experimentation with these three substances going, um, actually two of them we see going up consistently over the last several years. Um, we had almost eliminated uh, cigarette smoking and the use of nicotine among our teenagers some years ago. It was really quite rare that you would see um, or hear about a teen that was smoking cigarettes. But since the introduction of e-cigarettes and the jewel and vaping, um, that has all changed. Um, and so now we are seeing a huge resurgence again of young people that are using nicotine and becoming addicted to nicotine. Um, in fact, uh, I am seeing kids now um, as young as sixth grade that, you know, 11, 12 years old that are already vaping. Um, it used to be years ago in my practice that um, usually I wouldn't see this until you know, 14, 15, those, uh, you know, they're, they're doing it younger and younger now. Um, so it's easy, you know, easily accessible for, for our kids. Um, it certainly is acceptable among uh, them in their social groups because many kids are doing it. Um, and, uh, and so the use has increased and we've, we've seen that. Uh, for sure. Um, nicotine is probably um, one of the most addictive substances that we know of. Um, you know, there's this sort of uh, misconception, I think, among teens and among the uh, parents that somehow uh, these e-cigarettes or these pods are safer than, than smoking actual cigarettes. Um, I think the verdict is out on that right now. I don't think we know that for a fact. There are um, a lot of uh, other chemicals inside um, the liquid that is used for these vaping devices, um, nicotine obviously being the addictive substance, but there are things like uh, benzoic acid and glycerol and um, you know, propylene glycol and, uh, you know, even uh, cancer causing chemicals that um, we also would see in cigarettes. So um, I think we really haven't seen the effects of this and we probably won't for several years. I know um, a couple of years ago, we saw a lot of kids that were coming down with real, uh, they were being hospitalized even with, uh, you know, lung damage. Um, some of that was from nicotine based products and some of it was actually from uh, marijuana based or THC based products, which we're going to talk about a little bit today. So uh, unfortunately, very common among the kids, it's become sort of the new thing. 
Um, many kids uh, are experimenting. It does not take a lot for a child, a teenager to become addicted. In fact, um, I've seen kids using these devices for as little as a couple of weeks where I think they are meeting criteria for addiction. Um, once they become addicted, once um, they are uh, hooked on these, uh, on, on the, you know, the nicotine devices, it's very difficult to stop. Um, this has, th this is really one of the most sophisticated uh, nicotine delivery devices that, that we've really ever seen. Um, easy to hide, easy to conceal. Um, and so the kids will even take it to school. They'll use it in between classes. I even have kids that will use it in class. They're sitting in the back of the class. They will use it while they're in class. Um, now with COVID, so many kids are uh, taking school online. Um, they can just sort of, you know, go off to another room, use a little bit, come back to the computer and, and nobody knows that they're doing it. So uh, that's one of the problems. Um, the other thing um, that we're seeing is um, now we're seeing a lot of uh, marijuana use. In fact, these devices, these vapes can deliver nicotine, but they can also deliver THC. And so one of the, um, one of the most common ways that kids are ingesting marijuana these days or THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana, is through these cartridges. Um, and, and again, these, these vaping devices. Um, the, the THC that is in these devices is extremely potent. Um, you know, 20, 25 years ago, marijuana was a very different drug than it is today, right? They've created very sophisticated growing methods and they've uh, been able to produce a drug that is so concentrated that it causes addiction very easily among young people. Um, and we know this, right, because uh, the adolescent brain um, is, uh, you know, immature, right? The, the, the brain doesn't fully develop until probably 24 or 25 years old. That's what the latest research tells us. And so when you've got a 14, 15, 16 year old that begins, you know, consuming um, addictive substances, into a very vulnerable and immature brain, uh, it is often a recipe for disaster. And so what can take an adult, you know, months or even years to develop an addiction can happen in weeks or months in a, in a teenager. So it happens very quickly. Anytime you increase the potency of a drug, as we've seen with THC, um, certainly with these new uh, delivery devices, you increase um, its, its potential to cause addiction. So we are seeing lots of kids uh, using this method. It's unusual actually nowadays that I find a teenager who is smoking marijuana that is actually smoking the plant form. Um, some do, but more of the kids are actually using the, uh, the cartridge form, this oil that is uh, very potent. So we're talking in some cases 90, 95% THC in this oil versus in the plant form, uh, you know, 30, 35% in most cases. So a, a huge increase in the potency of the drug and, it, and its, uh, its potential to cause addiction. So, um, Lots of different methods. Um, you know, kids are still uh, smoking the plant form. They're doing edibles now too. They're doing the cartridges. Um, edibles are just anything really, candy, uh, brownies, cookies, anything that you can ingest uh, orally um, that has THC in it. And so uh, lots of kids are doing that. Um, I had uh, a couple of years ago, a young uh, college student, young adult that um, I was working with that was, uh, you know, an active user of marijuana, uh, went to school in Colorado, you know, college in Colorado, and one, uh, one uh, break, one of the vacations, he came home and he brought some edibles home with him. And he left a bag of candies, which were THC candies, sitting on his dresser. And his younger um, eight or nine or 10 year old brother 
uh, went in his room when he wasn't there and thought they were just candies. And he ate several of them, like a number of them. And uh, the, young, the young boy got so high on these edibles. Uh, I think you were supposed to eat one was the, the typical dose and he ate more than one, he ate several. He ended up at Miami Children's Hospital because he was hallucinating and he was just completely out of his mind. His parents did not know what was going on with him. And as it turned out, he had ingested his brother's uh, THC infused edibles and had to be taken to the hospital. So these are some of the dangers that, that are happening with, uh, with some of these drugs. Um, you know, um, you know, there is a lot of people right now. One of the things that's happening is that marijuana is being legalized in many states, either for medicinal use or um, even in even in many states for recreational use. And so anytime uh, a drug becomes legalized, what happens with teenagers is the perception of harm goes down, right? They think, well, it's legal, so it must not be really very harmful. And so that is seems to be what's driving um, an increase uh, that we're seeing in the use of marijuana among teens. What used to be the alcohol, um, certainly when I was growing up, lots of you know high school kids uh, would use alcohol. Um, marijuana seems to be the new, more popular form of um, altering their mood. Um, you know, kids still drink, but um, marijuana has certainly become much more popular. If you look at um, college kids, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's all over college campuses. And so as the potency is rising with this drug, we are seeing uh, kids having other issues, um, not just addiction, but they're having uh, higher incidence of mental health issues. We're seeing lots of kids with depression with anxiety, with even um, psychosis, some kids ending up having psychotic episodes. There, there is a lot of research right now being done that is um, you know, starting to show a link, some, some link between the use of marijuana and early onset schizophrenia. And I unfortunately in my practice do see a lot of young adults that are having first episode, second episode, even third episode of psychosis. And one thing they seem to all have in common is heavy chronic use of, of this very potent form of marijuana. So there are dangers there that we are certainly seeing among our young people um, and uh, the dangers associated with um, the use of marijuana. So it's not, uh, it's not this harmless drug that a lot of people think it is. Um, just like the nicotine, right? You know, same thing. Um, a lot of, a lot, I mean, if you think about why these devices, um, the, the, the e-cigarettes were developed in the first place, it was to help people stop smoking. And, um, and I think some people are able to stop smoking, but um, what's happened is it's actually introduced nicotine back into our young people and it's, and it's just increased addiction rates again. So now we have a whole lot of these kids that um, you know, can't stop using these devices and are growing up to be young adults and even older adults and are gonna, um, are gonna you know, deal with this addiction for a long time. So, um, you know, the Surgeon General a couple of years ago um, put out a statement and he said, not enough people know that today's marijuana is far more, more potent than in days past. The amount of THC, the component responsible for euphoria and intoxication, but also most of marijuana's documented harms has increased three to five fold over the last few decades. He went on to say, this ain't your mother's marijuana. I'm not sure what he meant by it's not your mother's marijuana. My mother certainly didn't smoke marijuana, but I guess th this isn't the marijuana that was around um, when, when I was growing up. And, and that's really the danger. So we're seeing an increase in um, uh, emergency department visits um, for these kids too, uh, particularly, as I said, with young adults um, you know, for psychosis. 
uh, also overdose and even accidental ingestions, like I said, with the, uh, the young child, the brother of uh, my client. Um, nearly one in five people who begin marijuana use during adolescence become addicted. So again, if we think about why uh, teens are so vulnerable, it really goes back to the to the brain development or lack thereof. Um, you know, kids are just more vulnerable, and kids are risk takers anyway, right? Young people want to take risks. They are looking for instant gratification. They are, um, you know, constantly looking for something to stimulate them, and drugs and alcohol provide that to a lot of them that start experimenting. And unfortunately, once we introduce these substances into the adolescent brain, the adolescent brain becomes, becomes um, dependent on that very quickly. And those pathways start to develop, and that's what begins the process of, of developing addiction um, and, and into, you know, for teens and, and into uh, young adulthood. Let's talk a little bit about alcohol, too, because um, these are certainly the most common three drugs that we see in young people, the nicotine, the marijuana, and the alcohol. Alcohol has sort of become one of those drugs that we've, I think, a, a lot of society has just accepted and thinks that it's okay for young people to drink. Um, you know, maybe we as adults drink um, you know, maybe we do, maybe we don't, but I think a lot of parents have also kind of accepted that this is just a normal part of adolescence. I deal with lots of young people who tell me that their parents are fine if they drink. They certainly don't want them coming home, you know, drunk all the time, or they don't want them driving. I think, I think kids have gotten better, certainly about drinking and driving. But, um, you know, the, the idea that um, alcohol, uh, you know, is okay for our teenagers to drink is, is really um, a slippery slope. Alcohol is a drug just like any other. Um, alcohol is actually more dangerous than a lot of other drugs. If you really look at it, more people die every year from alcohol-related causes than actually um, that, than die from all illicit drugs combined. So alcohol impairs judgment. It has the same potential to cause addiction in teens. And when we sort of combine the teenager inherent sort of, um, you know, desire to take risk and the fact that they don't have the same, you know, uh, executive part of the brain where they understand consequences and, and they're kind of uh, able to curb their impulses. If we mix that, that risk-taking behavior with the use of alcohol, it usually turns out to um, have severe consequences. And so um, a lot of kids uh, begin experimenting with alcohol at a young age, um, it's probably the drug that, um, that they begin experimenting with first. Uh, it's usually alcohol or the nicotine, and then they sort of move on to the marijuana after that. Um, and it's a problem, I think, uh, mostly because of how accepted it is among kids and among uh, adults. I actually work with a lot of parents who will tell me that they will provide the alcohol uh, to their kids. I had um, some parents in my office a couple of weeks ago who allowed their 16-year-old son to have about 10 friends over, and they allowed them to, allowed them to be in the backyard by the pool a uh, little getty, right, if you will, and they allowed those kids to bring alcohol and to consume alcohol in their, uh, in their backyard on their property. And um, when I challenged them about some of this and, and talked to them about some of the risks and what could happen, um, they, they seemed sort of surprised and they tried to rationalize it by saying that no, but they were supervising and they were making sure that the kids weren't going overboard and that nobody was drinking too much. And what I said was, well, what happens when one of those, one of those kids leaves your house and goes and gets in a car accident or hurts somebody or hurts himself or goes home and it's, you know, he's intoxicated and his parents see, you know, know that he was at your house and he was consuming alcohol. There's just a whole lot of serious consequences that could come from that 
But unfortunately, I hear that story a lot from a lot of parents who think this is sort of a normal, a normal rite of passage and that it's just, it's just what kids do. Um, there's also sort of a misconception, I think, among parents that, um, that we should be uh, teaching our children how to drink and that we don't want to wait until they go off to college because they won't know sort of how to drink. Well, all the data and all the research shows that that actually doesn't work and that if we um, introduce alcohol and we give them permission or we sanction it in any way, um, even if it's just at our home, um, we actually increase the likelihood that they will drink more on their own. And the research on that is pretty clear. So the, the idea that somehow we're, we're teaching them how to drink responsibly doesn't really match up with, uh, with the science. Um, we know the limbic system in teens is more, um, more developed than the prefrontal cortex. The limbic system is that sort of more primitive part of the brain, the part of the brain that's kind of responsible for just sort of seeking out pleasure and understanding what feels good. That, that prefrontal cortex is more that executive part of the brain that weighs consequences and can delay gratification. And, and so we know that that part of the brain, that executive part of the brain doesn't really fully mature until much later. Later. So I think our job as parents is to really try to delay our kids. If you know, if we can, if we can kind of get them through high school and get them to college age, even when, when they go away to college, I, I think that once they go away to college, it, it'd be pretty hard for us as parents to control what they're going to do. But by that point, they are 18 or 19 years old. Their brain is not fully matured, but but you know, well on its way. And even by that age, the, the, the likelihood of the risk goes way down that they would develop a problem uh, later on. So just some things um, for us to think about as parents, as we're really um, trying to understand how we can best support our teens. You know, we, we should expect that our teenagers are going to experiment with things. That's part of what being a teenager is. Um, they, they will experiment with alcohol and, and other substances and, and sex and, and, and other things. I think our job is to sort of put a container around them, have the structure, have the boundaries. And, and I think it's our job to um, discourage that kind of behavior as much as possible. We may not be able to eliminate it completely. We may not certainly have control over it all the time, but I think if our message is clear and we're um, you know, not encouraging that use, um, I think that we've done our job. And, um, and I think that, again, the research shows that parents that sort of take that approach have kids who grow up to um, drink responsibly and have a healthier um, relationship with alcohol. So, so what else can we do as parents? Well, I think it's important to, um, to model um, healthy behavior. That's one of the most important things is we have to model healthy behavior. If we um, are showing them that every day we come home and we've had a tough day at work and it's been stressful and the first thing we do is pour ourselves a drink, well, we're, we're kind of teaching them that that's how you deal with stress. And it, But instead, if we're modeling other healthy behaviors, if we're modeling exercise or you know, uh, meditation or just spending time with family, healthy, healthy coping skills, healthy problem solving skills, communication, supporting each other as a family. If we're mod modeling healthy behaviors, then that's what we will pass on to our kids. So I think that's really important. I think we also need to be real clear about what our attitudes are about alcohol and drugs. And we need to set clear limits and boundaries with our kids when it comes to use. Um, do we accept our, our teenager to go out on a, on a weekend night to go to a party? Is it okay if he or she drinks alcohol? How do we handle um, 
if our child starts vaping, experimenting with nicotine, what do we do if he or she starts using marijuana? These are conversations that you really want to start having with, uh, with your child when they're probably more in elementary school age, certainly into middle school, because if you wait until they're in middle school or high school, um, they're probably already being exposed by that point and maybe even experimenting because again, most kids start experimenting with alcohol, nicotine and uh, marijuana by about middle school age or certainly by about the ninth grade. Usually that eighth to ninth grade is pretty, pretty critical. So it's important to be having these conversations and it's important to be clear about where we stand. Um, Again, all the research shows that parents who are clear about their expectation and who have open conversations about these topics and, and aren't afraid to, to talk about and communicate um, around alcohol and drugs, those kids actually do better. Those kids grow up to have a healthy relationship. They may drink, they may, you know, be in college, but they, but they won't be as likely to get in trouble with it. So I think these are really important things for us to, to be able to model and talk about and show our kids that, um, that you can have a, a, a casual or a healthy relationship with, with some substances, right? Um, I mean, I, I certainly do know people that drink and, um, and don't have a problem. I even know people that um, may smoke marijuana occasionally. Um, I find that it's more difficult for people to have a casual relationship with nicotine because nicotine is so addictive, um, particularly for kids. So I think if you start using nicotine, there's a high likelihood, even if you're an adult, that you will actually become addicted to it. So, um, you know, I hope, I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, what I do want to say is that um, there are lots of kids out there that um, that don't necessarily get into trouble with these things. Lots of kids, I'd say the majority of kids will experiment and will decide that it's not for them or will delay their use until later on in college or, or even older. And so just because your child may experiment here and there doesn't mean that he or she is going to become addicted and going to have a serious problem. I think it's important for us to have these conversations, to expect that our kids likely will experiment um, and to not overreact to that, but to be very clear about, um, you know, in those situations when they do, what is our expectation? What are the consequences for use? Um, what are we going to do uh, if our child does start experimenting? And if you do think your child has a, a problem, there are places where you can go, right? And, and you can get advice. You can call someone like me, a therapist, a counselor in the community. You can go to the school. You can talk to the, to the guidance counselor, to the trust counselor. Um, what I would say is don't, don't just think it's going to work itself out. And don't be afraid to have the conversation and don't be afraid to talk to your child. I always tell parents it's much easier to deal with a substance issue when it first starts than it is after a year or two or three and it's had time to really progress and become more advanced. And then now you're dealing with possibly an addiction problem, which is more difficult to treat. It is always easier to deal with it um, in the early stages before it becomes a more serious problem. So um, don't fall into that trap of thinking that somehow it's gonna work itself out and um, because it often doesn't. And kids will often sort of continue experimenting with something, particularly something that, that can feel good to them, that, that creates euphoria, that is potentially addictive. They often will keep doing it until somebody gets in their way and sort of stops them from continuing. So that's my advice to you uh, as a parent. 
Um, I thank you um, uh, for listening and for being here tonight. Um, we did uh, three presentations. Tonight was the last one. Um, I do believe the city of Miami Beach is going to uh, post all three pr presentations on their website. So if you want to go back and review, if you want to see any of these presentations again, they will be um, available to you to do so. So thank you very much, everyone. And um, I hope you have a good evening. I hope this was helpful for you.